Maybe it's the cynic in me, but at the end of romantic comedies, I often find myself thinking, that couple's not going to make it. <laughs> right? Think about it. I hate to break it to you, everybody. Danny and Sandy in Greece, Johnny and Baby in Dirty Dancing, Joel and Clementine in Eternal Sunshine, Ariel and Prince Eric, they didn't even talk to each other. They're not going to make it. They're not going to live happily ever after. Why? Because those are stories of self-oriented, selfish people who are motivated by feelings and the excitement of circumstances, not by a real and lasting love that puts the other first. Now, the Roman Empire had a marriage problem. It was so bad, and this was news to me, and I wish they would teach interesting things like this, but it was so bad that Caesar Augustus, the guy we read about at Christmas time in Luke chapter 2, he passed laws making marriage mandatory in the empire. If you weren't married, you had to hit big taxes, and there was these other things going on. And if you got divorced, you had to marry again quickly after. And if you were between a certain age, if you were a man, and a certain age, if you were a woman, you had to be married. The result was the opposite of what Augustus intended. More people divorced. Seneca, writing around the same time that Paul wrote Ephesians, described divorce as rampant in the empire. Of course, not everyone in the Roman Empire was Roman. In the city of Ephesus, you'd find people who followed the Roman culture, some who followed the Jewish culture. You'd find Hellenists and pagans and blend of all everything in between. There were different types of marriages, legally speaking. It was, again, news to me to discover that in the Roman Empire, most wives stayed under the legal authority and jurisdiction of their father, not their husband, even after they were married. In fact, there were weird rules that as long as a Roman wife stayed out of her house for at least three nights a year, she belonged legally to her father and not to her husband. Now, some wives were legally transferred to the authority of their husband, almost like a slave or a piece of property. And then you had Jewish couples. They did things differently. And now here's Christianity, right? You're, you're a Christian in the city of Ephesus. What would marriage be in the church? What is this relationship going to be like? What is, what is the status? What is the perspective? What is the execution of this thing? Paul has been talking about God's unfolding cosmic plan and how it touches every corner and area of our lives, a new way to be human. And so what form would marriage take, this most basic of human relationships? The answer is given in our text tonight, and it was shockingly countercultural at the time. And the truth is, it's still countercultural today, at least against our culture. It's controversial even. Whole denominations go their separate ways at this crossroads of Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. This passage is often misunderstood or ignored or misapplied. Even those of us who take a conservative approach to the doctrine taught here, if we're honest, I think sometimes we squirm at how some of the words sound as we read them. But let's remember what Paul has been talking about for five chapters now to this group of Christians in the city of Ephesus and to us by extension. He's been talking about God's incredible, powerful, world-changing grace filling us up and flowing out of us so that we can put Christ on display. We're in a long intersection of the book here where Paul is teaching us how to walk worthy of the grace, walk worthy of the calling, walk worthy as children of light, how to walk with Jesus and experience all he desires for us. And Paul's been talking about our relationships with others generally. We've had a few weeks off, but that's what he's been talking about, our, our relationships generally with other people and how we should navigate the world since we are Christians. And so now he's going to move to specifically address husbands and wives, then parents and children, and finally masters and slaves. And so we're going to take the first pair this evening, beginning in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we're members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Okay, if we hear that read, and if we feel uncomfortable or offended or upset in some way, then we either do not understand correctly what God is communicating or we are allowing rebellion to rattle in our hearts because we know that God is good and that God is right and that he has our best interests in mind. Now, our culture is gonna come to us and say, that whole arrangement that was just described to you, does it matter, does it work, shouldn't be? And so we wanna take a look at this and remind ourselves that God has a plan for our lives, a plan for our families that are gonna benefit us, is gonna benefit society as a whole and is going to glorify himself. Now, I wanna be careful when a text is controversial and this is a controversial text. So let me get a few disclaimers out in the open as we move into the text. First, here at Calvary, we are what's called complementarian. And that means that we believe the Bible teaches that men and women are absolutely equal in the eyes of God concerning his love for them and their value in his plan. Women are not inferior to men. Men are not inferior to women. They are absolutely equal. But we recognize that God has established distinct roles for men and women in the family and in the church. The other side of that debate is called egalitarianism. And that view says, well, there are absolutely no distinctions between Christian men and Christian women when it comes to roles in the home or roles in the church. Now, second, this doctrine is a non-essential issue. Important, very important. Uh, and it matters a whole lot. Paul gives a lot of attention to it, but it is a non-essential issue. Salvation doesn't hinge on whether you interpret Ephesians 5 as a complementarian or an, as an egalitarian. And so we want to have charity towards our brothers and sisters as we seek to apply and interpret the word of God. Third, and very importantly, if you are in an abusive relationship, even if that person claims to be a Christian, you need to remove yourself from that environment. You need to call the police. You need to get uh, safe and seek help and we will help you. Submission, which we're gonna talk about tonight, does not include victimization. And so all those things just out in the open, just wanna get those you know, across the slate as quickly as possible so now we can take a look at this text. Now let's remember what we have read before. Remember, uh, the Ephesians weren't reading this text a few verses at a time, weeks at a time, and taking weeks off. It was all just being read to them all at once. And I guarantee you that after these six chapters were read, somebody said, can we circle back and read it again? I got distracted by a couple of the things you were talking about there, about the devil's fiery darts. Can we come back and talk about some of these things again? But in verse 21, which immediately preceded what I just read, Paul told all Christians, he commanded us and he said, submit to one another in the fear of Christ. How do we do that? We talked a little bit about it last time, but how do we submit to one another? It's interesting that Paul is going to then explain to different groups how to accomplish that. And he begins by giving specific direction to Christian wives. He says in verse 22, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So verse 21 says, submit to one another. And then Paul says, and now wives, here's, here's how you do that. In fact, the word submit, the verb, isn't actually in verse 22. It is supplied by translators for clarity. What Paul said was that Christians should submit to one another in the fear of Christ, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. And so the word submit means to place yourself under authority. It does not mean blind obedience or docile servility. 
Paul will use the word respect as a synonym, as a descriptor in verse 33. And so Christian wives are called to place themselves under the God-given leadership of their husbands and to respect their husbands. And so we might also say a woman's to recognize the husband's leadership in their marriage relationship. It's not just, I have to do whatever my husband says, that's how I'm submitted to him. That's not what Paul says. And unfortunately, that's the way that this term and this verse is often interpreted by egotistical men who do want to control their wives. But Paul didn't say, obey everything your husband say to do. He, 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 as if the wife is a child or as if the wife is a slave. He's going to say to the children, children, obey your parents. And to the wife, he says, I want you to to submit to your husband. And the way you do that is by respecting him and acknowledging the arrangement that God has made in the Christian family. I would say that the spirit of biblical submission is demonstrated for us really wonderfully on a devotional level in the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Now they're not married, obviously. But the spirit and devotional aspect of what it means for a person to submit to another is perfectly demonstrated here. Jonathan and his armor bearer, if you're not familiar with the story, man, go check it out. Jonathan, maybe my favorite character in all the Old Testament. And, is, and, and he gets kind of crowded out by the big personalities of David and Saul. But Jonathan, man, man, would he have been a great king. Uh, and he has this great story where he wants to go and attack the Philistine garrison. His dad's sitting around under a tree. That's all his dad ever did. <laughs> and the Philistines are there. And so he grabs his armor bearer and he says, hey man, why don't we go over here? And the armor bearer says, yeah, let's do it. And so they go together and you have this incredible story. They were in it together. They traveled and moved together. They each had a very clearly defined role, but it was a partnership. They were they were friends together. They were joined together. There was communication and cooperation. They were both walking by faith. It was a unit. It was a unity here. The armor bearer even advised Jonathan at one point, but then ultimately they recognized that Jonathan was the one responsible for their actions, responsible for the final decision that day. And Jonathan was in the lead as they went together. And the armor bearer said to him, do what is in your heart. Go ahead. I'm completely with you. And so on a spiritual and devotional level, what a great picture of what it means to submit and what it means to respect and what it means to be unified in relationship. And we have to understand that as Paul explains all of these things about the marriage relationship, he has such a focus on unity within that relationship. And he says, hey, this is the way that we get there. Now in the Roman empire, most married women, as I said, were not subject to their husbands, not legally, not relationally. Most were still under the authority of their fathers and their fathers could decide whether they were still married or whether they were divorced based off of what they wanted. On the other hand, some of the ladies in Ephesus had probably won the legal emancipation from anyone that Augustus offered. You see, Augustus said, hey, by the way, they had a marriage problem. They had a, therefore, a children problem. And so he said, if you're a married woman and you have at least three kids, you will be emancipated from your dad and from your husband and you'll be a new free agent. And again, we, the research shows that that led to just more problems, right? It led to more adultery between men and women. It led to more divorce. It, this is always what happens when humans try to solve uh, uh, like deep spiritual issues with human laws. And so some of them had no doubt emancipated themselves from their father and their husband. Many of them were, were not under the jurisdiction legally of their husband, but of their father. There were all these weird laws. Husbands and wives in the Roman Empire we're not allowed to give each other gifts. It was a weird law that was on the books. You could give a gift to your concubine or your mistress, but not your wife. That would be wrong. And you see, there, these, these, all these relationships were twisted and ruined and about who, who, who gets to be away from the other person. And who's leveraging, you know, uh, you know, power over the other person. And it was leading to all of this societal brokenness and things like that. 
And so either way, whether you are a person that was under the authority of your father or whether you had emancipated yourself, these ladies would have to turn from the cultural norm and choose God's design. And, you know, if your husband wasn't a Christian, this is a hard ask. Absolutely difficult. Uh, Roman husbands were not the kind of husbands you want. They're not the kind of men that deserved to have wives. Adultery was totally normalized, totally commonplace. It was expected that you would have mistresses and concubines and do all of this weird stuff, not to mention the crazy perverted behavior that we've talked about if you were involved in one of these mystery cults in previous passages. Men weren't expected to care about their wives in the Roman Empire. In fact, wives were just supposed to manage things in the household to such a degree that men could ignore the household and just be out in the public square doing whatever they wanted, enhancing their own social prestige and just ignoring their family. I'm out to be for myself. I'm out in the public square. I need to have a house. I I legally have to have a wife. So you do all of that so that I can ignore you and I can ignore my family and I can be out doing all this other stuff, right? Now, among Jewish couples, things weren't that bad, but they weren't much better. Some rabbis at the time advised, and you know, many of the Jewish people would follow the teachings of the rabbis. Let me read to you what was advised by a couple of the rabbis. Do not talk much with a woman, not even with one's wife. Do you think that's going to lead to good marriage relationships? I don't. But that's not how a Christian marriage was going to be. It wasn't going to be Roman. It wasn't going to be Jewish. It wasn't going to be Hellenist. It wasn't going to be pagan. It was going to be its own thing. And it was going to be revolutionary because Paul was presenting this from the Lord as husband and wife are equal in the eyes of God equal in worth, equal in agency, equal in ability to decide for themselves how they were going to live their lives. Marriage would be a unified partnership in God's economy. And and God was saying, hey, listen, marriage is not about uh, following the letter of the law and marriage is not about getting to this, you know, uh, getting to certain social status or whatever. Marriage is a special relationship that takes precedence over every other relationship in the world. And it's going to do much more than that, as we're going to see in the coming uh, verses. But it was a special thing. Notice, it's not that all women have to submit to all men. It's a wife submits to her husband. And, And then we're going to get to what the husband is going to do about that. Now, notice, though, Paul does not say Submit to your husband as long as he does his part. Instead, the commands in this section to both husband and wife are disconnected from whether the other person is walking worthy or not. To both husband and wife, Paul looks, looks at us in the eyes and he says, do what you're being asked to do as unto the Lord. Because it is a service to him because it is an acknowledgement that he is true and that he is right and that you are willing to go his way. And so the ladies here, they had a voluntary choice to accept this special purpose. And even though it seems counterintuitive to the human mind, to the human design, and even though our culture even still today says this kind of arrangement is oppressive, God says, no, this is how a husband and a wife can be elevated to something beyond human understanding. Verse 23 continues, because the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Now, those in the egalitarian camp work hard to strip any sense of authority out of the word head here, but it's clear that Christ's headship includes authority. But then this is the important question. What does Jesus do with his authority? Does Christ act in selfish ways? Does he act in arbitrary ways, in harsh ways? Does he do rude things to make a point to us? As head, Christ is totally gracious, totally kind, totally understanding, totally tender. And so Paul's saying, yeah, men, in God's arrangement of the Christian marriage, men have authority not to reign with swagger. It is a responsibility to serve. That's what you're authorized to do to serve, to act like Jesus acts to the church. The problem is 
many Christian men are asleep at their post, disengaged from this duty. Or instead of mimicking Christ, they imitate some teapot tyrant. You've heard a man say, I'm the king of my castle. Our king is one who left his throne. He, he left his throne on behalf of those he loved. And he gave himself, he poured himself out on behalf of those he loves. These verses are not a license for Christian husbands to demand their wives do whatever they want or force submission. This is presented to ladies as a choice. Paul does not say, husbands, subjugate your wives. He gives it to the, the ladies as a choice. He says, ladies, you have an opportunity to recognize the arrangement God wants in your family and to respect your husband. But at the same time, yes, it is a choice for them, but it's also a line in the sand for Christian wives. You see, way back in the Garden of Eden, which Paul is gonna reference, after Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord came to them and he explained the consequences of sin. There was a lot of them, all of them bad. And he said that one of the consequences of Eve's sin was that Eve's desire will be for your husband and yet he will rule over you. Now we understand that to mean that generally speaking, there would be a propensity within Eve's heart and her daughters to contend with their husbands for leadership in the relationship. And that that was a result of sin and that the Lord was going to say, and now I want to correct that on this side of eternity. And you're going to do that by walking worthy in this way. And so now Christian wives have a choice to go God's way and to recognize God's established order and trust that his way is the best way for individuals and families and the church and for society. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are also to submit to their husbands in everything. Ah, there it is. Husbands just get to say whatever they want, make every decision. They don't need input. They don't need communication. They just do whatever they want and the wife has to do it. Huzzah. That's not what's being said. It doesn't mean that every command a husband gives, a wife just has to obey. That's not what Paul's talking about. After all, no wife needs to obey a husband who asks her to ignore God's commands, who asks her to do something immoral, right? So, so what does Paul mean? We wanna be careful. And so Paul's talking about, hey, in all spheres of life, that you're not withholding something back in this relationship and saying, well, I will give, I will open myself up this far to my husband, but this part is mine. That's not what the Lord wants for us. Paul really wants us to understand that the husband and wife relationship is like the Christ church relationship. He says, that's how I want you to understand this special thing that God has established. Look at Christ in the church. And then we can apply these things to this special relationship. And of course, the church has a great deal of freedom and opportunity and agency, all sorts of resources that the, that the Messiah has given to her. And yet the church is to be led by the Lord and in constant communion with him. And so Paul is talking about these things and he's saying, hey, this is the arrangement that God has made for your good and for his glory. And now he turns to the husbands. And let me say, right now, he has three times as many verses to the husbands as he does to the wives. Because we need to hear it. And he's going to say, hey, remember what I just said? Here's what I'm saying. <laughs> let me say it again to you if you guys weren't paying attention. So he says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands, you Christian husbands here tonight, you have been put in a position of leadership in your marriage and your family, but that leadership is so that you can protect and provide and help your family thrive and grow in the Lord and become what God has made them to be. That's your responsibility and duty. You are to use your authority, your power, your strength, in this case, for your wife. That's what your power is for. That's what your position is for. That's what your life is for, according to these verses. And so the wife is to respect her husband, to submit to him, but where, it, where we might expect Paul then to say, husbands, rule your wives, or let's church it up a little bit. Husbands, you know, manage your wives. That sounds a little less harsh. We might expect him, okay, wives, you need to submit to your husband, so husbands, you need to manage your wives. No, he says, husbands, love your wives. 
He does not say, husbands, subject your wives. He does not say, husbands, domineer over your wives. He does not say, husbands, line up your wives. He says, husbands, love your wives. In the Roman culture, as I said, a husband didn't have a duty to his wife. He didn't have to do right by her. Men lived for themselves, for their own greatness, for their own pleasure, for their own whims, but not so the Christian husband. We are commanded to fulfill our wives, to build her up the way Christ builds the church, to focus our attention on her. And you know, romantic love isn't enough. We're called to agape love, which is a continuing deliberate attitude of care and affection that goes beyond words into action. It's not enough for you to bring home a paycheck, guys. That's important, but it's not, that's not enough. That's not the point of your life. I brought home a paycheck. Okay, that's part of it. It's not enough to just be a good man or not to be a bad man. God calls his disciples to be husbands who give themselves for their wives just as Christ gave himself for the church. It's a total commitment. In Isaiah 54, the Lord says, though the mountains move and the hills shake, my love will not be removed from you. And then Paul says to husbands, yeah, love your wife like that. The way that Christ loves the church. It's interesting to me, there are teachers and churches and traditions that really major on wives needing to submit. And unfortunately, in practice, it ends up that wives need to be subjugated is what it ends up happening. And I don't think I've ever heard any of those folks ask whether husbands are properly loving their wives. It's always just verse 22 and never verse 25. Never a question of, hey, did you pour yourself out for your wife today? Christ is the model. Can you imagine Jesus saying, listen, I don't need to say I love you. I do that by going to work every day. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus Christ complaining about dirty dishes or failing to help with the dirty dishes? Can you imagine Jesus Christ just being so excited to spend all his free time away from his bride in my man cave? <laughs> right? Now listen, if you have a man cave, that's fine. And, and if you spend time with your friends, that might be fine, right? But we need to reckon with this. And Paul looks us again square in the face and he says, you need to love your wife like Christ loves the church. And I'll say this to myself, I need this rebuke and encouragement that Jesus never says, Man, I, I need a break. You people. I need 20 minutes, you know, like he doesn't, he doesn't. Christ is the model. Now remember in verse 21, Paul said, we submit to one another. And this is how husbands fulfill that calling, by loving the way Christ loves. Both husband and wife are called to sacrifice themselves for the sake of the marriage. The husband taking the lead in duty and responsibility in saying, we're gonna walk together towards the Lord and I'm going to make sure that we, the caravan of our family gets there. That's the deal. Verse 26, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. Paul takes some time to describe how Christ loves the church in these verses because husbands need an object lesson and so that we can better understand how to properly imitate the person we're supposed to be imitating. Now, husbands do not make their wives holy, right? Husbands, that, you don't save your wife. You don't make her holy. But what, what we're seeing here is God wants us to have more than a menial day-to-day -day view of our marriage relationship. Husbands should have a comprehensive concern for their wives' physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Now, Paul does something interesting here when he says, washing by the word. Uh, I'm not a Greek scholar, but there are a couple of terms for the word of God in the Bible. Maybe you've heard the term logos. And I'm sure if anybody is a Greek scholar, they're yelling at me because it's either logos or logos and nobody knows. I don't know. I certainly don't know. But we, Jesus is the word of God, the word logos. And, but there's this other word and Paul uses a different word here. He says the rima. It's a spoken word. And so Jesus does a great work of cleansing his church through personal, active, verbal communication, word that is spoken. And so men, as we follow the Lord's example, we must be husbands who actively communicate with our wives. Sitting in silence will not do. It's not what Jesus did. 
And therefore, it's not what we should do. Verse 27, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that. I love that. But holy and blameless. Let's all just take a minute to be relieved by this promise. One day, because of Christ's love, because of his faithfulness, because of his power and ability, you are going to be absolutely spotless and blameless before God. No stain, no wrinkle, no snag, no anything. Presented perfect before God the Father. And there the Godhead is gonna be. And they're gonna be saying to each other, look, look what we did. Look what we did for these people that we love. And we're gonna look around and be like, man, look what you did. I don't know how you made this out of that. <laughs> and, but this is a promise and let's, let's be excited about it. But the tenderness of Christ is on display here. Think of this image. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, but all these things. But, but let, let's, put, let's put some flesh and bones on this. The image is of Jesus Christ choosing his bride whom he loves and paying a ransom to save her from captivity and then paying all the bills and all the fees that are necessary so that they could marry, he could marry his bride and bring her to a home that he made himself and then on the day of the wedding, he goes and gets her dress prepped and he does her hair and he readies the party and he puts everything in order and he walks the bride down to deliver the bride to himself. He says, I want to do all of those things. I don't want my best man to do that. I don't want these people to do that. I want to do everything for my bride and I'm going to do it. It's an amazing portrait of care and affection and gentleness. Jesus does not compete against his bride. He does not harbor grudges or resentments toward her in his heart. He doesn't demand that his bride do certain things to keep him from leaving. His love is constant. And his value of you does not change depending on how you look on a certain day. You are lovely because Christ loves you every day of your life. And he will never stop loving you. He will never fall out of love with you. And when it says he presents the church to himself, the term means to place beside. And it calls us back again to this image of Adam and Eve. And so, yeah, again, even though Christ is the head, there's no oppression or subjugation or pressing down here. After all, Christ says his church is gonna reign with him, that he's sharing his inheritance with us. Verse 28 continues, in the same way, Husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And so husbands, Christian husbands, you and I are to examine the methods Jesus uses and apply them to your marriage. Your wife is not a subject to be ruled. She is part of who you are. You are one flesh. God carved Eve out of Adam's side. It wasn't one rib, it was his side. And there she was presented beside him. And then they spent their lives together as a new thing to becoming one. An amazing heavenly thing, unlike any other relationship. Do you know that researchers have proven that, that the heart rhythms of people in uh, long-term loving relationships synchronize when they're close to each other? That when you're with your spouse and you're together in close proximity, your hearts actually start beating in sync. And this is what the Lord desires. Not just the muscle of the heart, but the beating of, of the life heart, right? That we would be synchronized together, fused two into one, physically and emotionally and spiritually, a special unified unit purposefully ordered for best results. By the way, where my version there says husbands are to, yours may say ought to or must or should. The term refers to a debt you owe, a moral requirement. And so husbands, Christian husbands, you owe a debt to God. And that debt is to love your wife. Verse 29, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we're members of his body. And so provision that we're seeing here, it's more than a paycheck. As I said, God calls husbands to nourish and cherish his wife. Your translation may even use those words. Now, 
This is a mixed group of people. At this point, someone might ask, yeah, listen, it's been a half hour. I'm not married. What, what, am I some kind of second-class citizen in God's plan? Absolutely not. You know, a single person in Rome was a second-class citizen. You paid higher taxes and these things. Not so in God's kingdom. You know, Paul elsewhere explained that sometimes it's better to not be married. He says, hey, you people who are not married, don't get married. Not because marriage is hard, but because persecution was coming. Or he said, hey, you know, the Lord doesn't want some of you to get married because he's going to call you into a different kind of life of ministry than you can do if you're married. And so it's, it, we want to have a good theology of singleness too. If you're single, that is great. If you're married, that is great. What matters is what does the Lord want? So if you're single here tonight, you need to seek the Lord and ask him whether he's calling you to be married or not. And if the answer is not, that's great because the Lord has great things for you. Meanwhile, we're reminded that the Lord is thoughtful of us. Every single person here, whether you're married, single, divorced, twice divorced, it doesn't matter. The Lord is thoughtful of you. You're not just a cog in his machine. You're not just a number on a report. He cares for you individually and personally. Every member of his body matters. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So Paul quotes Genesis 2 here. This has been God's plan all along for the marriage relationship. He established these relationships and these designs on purpose for our good and so that we can reveal the glory of God through our lives. You see, Christian marriage is meant to illuminate Christ's love for the church. A Christian husband and wife are meant to be a visible tabernacle of God modeling the realities of heaven. Remember the tabernacle in the wilderness? The Lord said to Moses, you need to, to build this thing which is a model of what is real in heaven. The tabernacle in the wilderness was the model, was the copy. There's a real tabernacle in heaven. And in the same way, he says, your marriage, Christian husband and Christian wife, is meant to be a diorama, a physical demonstration to the world of how Christ loves the church. And that ad is gonna light that up for the world to see. The joining of husband and wife talked about here, joined to his wife, it's meant to happen on the deepest, most comprehensive level. I learned this week that Canadian scientists have developed what they're calling hyperglue. It's a glue that bonds at the molecular level. And you know what? It is able to bond materials that other glues cannot bond certain kinds of plastics and things that all the other conventional glues just doesn't stick. It says, oh, but hyperglue does. Wear gloves when you use it, right? <laughs> but this is what the Lord wants to do between a man and a woman for life. Hyperglue them together in a single unified partnership. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul admits that this is a hard topic to understand. It's not easy to apprehend. It's certainly not easy to carry out. But what are mysteries in the New Testament? What are mysteries in Ephesians? We've encountered them before. They are things that God wants to reveal to and through his people. Back in chapter three, Paul said God was revealing mysteries so that God should shine light, could shine light in the world and make his wisdom known through the church. And so as we believe God and trust that he's telling us the truth, as we walk with him by faith, according to his design in our marriages, God makes his power and grace and wisdom known to the world and to the authorities in the heavens through our example. He says, let me show what I can do. Because this is one of God's mysteries. What we're learning here cannot be totally reconciled by human logic or strategy. How can I be elevated by humbling myself to serve my wife or by humbling myself by submitting and respecting my husband? How can lowering myself lead to my benefit and increase? It doesn't work in the human mind and with human math, but it works through the power of God's grace because that's power that moves mountains. That's power that overcomes all obstacles. Verse 33, to sum up, I love that, but you don't get that a lot from Paul. To sum up, each one of you husbands is to love his wife as himself and the wife is to respect her husband. That's the deal. If you're a Christian, do it. That's the deal. A critic might say, oh, the Bible just promotes the patriarchy. That's a buzzword in our culture today, right? No, the Bible isn't promoting a patriarchy. It's promoting a Christiarchy, right? 
That's not a word, but that's what it's promoting. And here Paul has detailed the ideal arrangement between a Christian husband and a Christian wife. And obviously, all of us here and all of the, the people who originally heard this letter, not all of them had the ideal arrangement. And the Lord knows and the Lord understands. Not everyone has a Christian husband or a Christian wife. And those who do don't always have a spouse who is walking the way God asks us to walk. The Lord understands that. And there's no condemnation. This text is not a condemnation, it is an invitation. It's one of those texts, we talked a little bit about this on Sunday in our study in Isaiah. It's a text that bids me to come and die and find that I will truly live, like the old hymn says. If you're a Christian and you're married, you have a part to play as you walk with the Lord. Now, culture wants to dismantle that design, dismantle that arrangement. The world around us especially wants women in particular to reject God's design and to emancipate themselves from any idea that they would, would not be in a leadership position. In fact, some Christians today would say, yeah, women submitting isn't a thing anymore. One wonders if they would also turn to verse 25 and say, yeah, men loving their wives isn't a thing anymore. We don't parse the scripture like that. We trust God and we believe that his design is the best and that it's the only way forward. God's desire is that his people experience power and grace and fulfillment and ministry in their marriages. If you want to see what God wants for his people, go back to Ephesians 1 through 3. And that will remove any fears that God might be doing something wrong to us. He has revealed a mysterious truth that this is the way to do it. Love and respect, unity and sacrifice which shows the world that Christ is real, that he has power, that he loves, and that he can do what nothing else on earth can do. 